Hong Kong is caught in the escalating cause fire mm -hmm. between the United States and mainland mm -hmm. China over the national security law. Um, will the city's reception worsen in the second half of this year? Can you elaborate? Well, I think, well, we have been there before. Uh, actually, while we are now talking about sort of heightened sort of U.S.-China tension, but actually looking back the last two years, I think, well, there, is, there seemed to be sort of a, um, a no quiet moment between these two big nations, uh, including our, our, our motherland. Uh, Hong Kong has been suffering from the collateral damage in day one when U.S.-China trade war started. Uh, but looking back, uh, I don't think there is much we can do about it except doing uh, doing our best in coping with the situation. Then, um, do you find it even worse than the previous time? Well, I think it, it all depends on where would this go. But all the figures point to one fact, that, well, whenever there is a major trade war between big powers, global economy suffers. And I think we, are, we have already seen the uh, global sort of economic engine slow down because, well, China alone contributes uh, almost one third of this global growth uh, in in the last decades or so. And I think the US-China trade actually complement each other a lot. But as you can see uh, from Hong Kong, well, Hong Kong is very exception because while uh, US complain about trade uh, deficit with China, US actually enjoy the largest number of uh, trade surplus from Hong Kong. But in the, only in the last two years, when US-China uh, went to so-called trade war, US surplus uh, from Hong Kong actually reduced. They have reduced for the first time below the 30 billion uh, mark uh, last year uh, against the sort of annual sort of 30 uh, billion dollar in the last decade or so. So if that's an, an ind indication, then actually, well, we all suffer, but uh, somebody suffer more than, than others. It depends on the relative strength and also the trade pattern. Then can you give some idea what mm. the recovery path will be? Well, <laughs> I think, uh, there is a common belief around the world, perhaps with a few exceptions, that well, actually, uh, more trade would promote economic prosperity. But apparently, there there is different school of thought uh, only in the last couple of years. Uh, but I think from from where Hong Kong stands, we believe that only by removing barriers could facilitate could facilitate trade. And this trade, I'm not just saying about commodity trade, but also surface trade. As uh, we see tension continues, as we see sort of non-trade, uh, non-tariff or tariff barriers, it will only sort of reduce uh, cross-Pacific uh, sort of transactions and even hurting sort of business sentiment. And we are also seeing FDIs of these two big countries also coming down. So I think the recovery all depends on whether this, there will be a reverse engine to ease the uh, sort of tension to come back to sort of more sort of common sense approach, to come back to the formula that we have seen in the past that trade and economic prosperity are in fact relating to each other. Right, so yeah. in this tit for tat <coughs> situation, who will be the biggest loser out of Hong Kong, the US or China? I think, well, uh, Hong Kong is always a believer that there is no winner in a, in a trade war. So we all stand to lose. But I think it, will, it also depends on the relative strength of different economy. Now, um, the, the uh, double remedy of uh, sort of US-China trade tension plus COVID-19 actually changed the sort of a global economy. That looking ahead, I don't think there will be easy time in the distant future because trade services, traveling will all be suffered, right? But uh, then everybody would go inward depending on sort of internal consumption as the major driving force uh, against the headwind of sort of reduced uh, global trade. But when we compare the two economies, look at mainland China, I think they have 1.4 billion sort of a, a local population, obviously a much sizable market. And also the internal efficiency in terms of logistics, e-commerce nowadays, in fact facilitate this internal consumption, perhaps more easily than the other side of the Pacific. So in terms of resilience, uh, well, I believe, well, on this side of the Pacific, both mainland China or even ASEAN countries together with Hong Kong stand a, a stronger resilience against this headwind. As to the other side of the Pacific, I think it all depends on how soon um, the governments are able to put their hands on top of the epidemic spreading. Because up till now, we are still seeing sort of community outbreak at major scale. So uh, before the first battle against the COVID-19 could be uh, won, I don't think there is much room for a very speedy uh, economic re recovery. 
I think that's the, the, the reality that we, we have to live with. Right. When you mention collateral uh, mm -hmm. damages, yeah. can you elaborate a bit more on what this consequence on Hong Kong? Well, the consequences would, of course, be a reduced uh, sort of uh, trade and also uh, services uh, transactions. Uh, now, we are seeing that different economies are being hit uh, differently. For instance, uh, a community relying uh, a lot on traveling, on tourism, of course, will be, will be hard hit. Now, fortunately, Hong Kong, while uh, it is a major sector, but actually, tourism's contribution to our GDP is around 5%, compared with trade finances up to 50%. So you can see the differences. So uh, comparing a uh, country in our, in our vicinity, it all depends on how outgoing they are, how externally uh, related they are, and also how strong uh, are their respective internal economy. If there is an internal consumption that can sort of fill in the gap for the time being, I think they perhaps could uh, withstand the, uh, the, the heat uh, um, um, more strongly than, than others. But I don't think there is any quick fix uh, for anybody around the world. So priority still remains tackle the COVID-19, uh, hoping there will be easing of tension uh, globally and also the earlier we resume trade, tourism, traveling uh, and services, the better. Right. So um, what do you see about the recovery of tourism, especially mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, will look like? I don't think there is uh, any sort of immediate sort of a, a reopening of all the, all the sort of the boundaries or border points. Uh, particularly uh, the, the pandemic is still hitting very hard. We are talking about still sort of uh, hundreds of thousand people sort of a, uh, uh, casualty and also sort of millions of people suffering and the overall number is still on the rise. So uh, I don't think uh, there will be any easing of the uh, travel ban in the short, uh, in, in short time. So we have to cope with the situation. Now the Hong Kong formula would be one that will be strengthening our basics, that we are trying to roll out uh, tourism at home. Uh, what we call holiday at Hong Kong, meaning that well, the 7.5 million Hong Kong people can still enjoy fruit staycation through uh, spending the weekend in a package of poach, uh, visiting our own sort of tourism spots, uh, enjoying the time as both an internal consumption as well as a big sort of a publicity or promotion eventually when the boundary sort of uh, uh, reopens. So when can we freely travel again? Because the government is talking about forming uh, travel bubbles mm -hmm. with some destinations. Yeah, yeah. We are, well, I think different countries, different governments are anxious in reopening uh, the, the, the boundary. But of course, everybody would be highly, highly cautious. Now, first of and foremost, we, uh, I believe uh, there would be a lot of bilateral corridor, or so-called travel bubble, to be uh, 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 started with. But that would only be successful among um, countries or economy that are of sort of a comfortable situation as far as the containment of COVID-19 is concerned before any government or any economy able to put a hand on top of the problem. I, think, I don't think they're, they're prepared for allowing their people to go out or allowing visitors to come back. So this must be done through a bilateral basis. So that's why we are starting uh, with a few uh, selected economy looking at how they've uh, uh, pandemic situation uh, is un put under control and how uh, respective government are coping with the situation, medical care, public health, hygiene. Now, also, uh, there would need to be protocol to be established. For instance, I don't think uh, traveling could resume without a pre-departure uh, screening through the uh, sort of uh, uh, testing. Only by sort of having a clean and safe test before people bought on the plane. I don't think the receiving end would have the comfort of receiving these visitors. Now, those would need to be agreed upon because our well, testing protocol would need to be agreed and also testing results would need to be accredited so people would be comfortable and then they can resume travel instead of having the quarantine at the receiving end. Right, so can you name some jurisdictions or markets that potentially we will have uh -huh. travel bubbles with? Well, there are, there, are, there are discussions starting on among different countries, but uh, Hong Kong, well, what has been in the open has been the, the one between Hong Kong and Thailand that we announced uh, two days ago that well, both sides would uh, sit down and explore through uh, intergovernmental sort of a discussion. We're also knocking on doors of some other country uh, and government where they seem to be sort of uh, getting sort of control of the situation. But I think uh, a word of caution would be uh, it all 
would involve quite a sort of a dedicated discussion, uh, going through the protocol, the testing, uh, the arrangement that we ha that I mentioned. And globally, I think what it appears this side Pacific is slightly more comfortable uh, that we can start conversation than the other side. But I think, well, it depends on the, the situation uh, on, on both the epidemic, epidemic side and also uh, how prepared we are uh, between governments. Right. So what actions should industries like aviation, mm -hmm. uh, tourism, retail and F&B take to reinvent themselves? Well, definitely, I think the whole world will be highly sort of cautious and prudent, uh, which are necessary. Uh, for instance, even when you go to cinema these days, when you're watching a movie, there are a lot of, a lot of conditions that well, uh, the cinema operator would impose and also the audience would also need to take precaution, let alone sort of traveling abroad. So I think first, first and foremost that well, we, we should sort of uh, get prepared for the new normal, that uh, it would be highly public hygiene, public health sort of driven. And secondly, I think there will be a great demand for testing, a credible testing, which will be recognized sort of a bilaterally or multilaterally. And thirdly, I think uh, there would uh, be a trend of starting small so that, well, we build the confidence, uh, we, we ensure that, well, uh, public health would not be compromised before we talk about any other things. And of, of course, uh, uh, essential traveling would start first. But essential traveling does not necessarily mean only business. Right? Because well, there might be family reasons, studying or, or research, uh, collaboration. So I think the whole world will need to sort of compete for the limited window available along this corridor or bubbles. Uh, it must be built on safe, uh, secure, and mutually agreeable and recognized sort of standard. So I believe well, there will be new standard coming up uh, in this sort of new arrangement. I see. Thank you so much. Thank you.